In Kenneth Branagh's 1994 film rendition of Mary Shelley's classic novel, Victor Frankenstein and his creation meet in an ice cave to discuss their rights and responsibilities towards each other. In one sublime exchange, the creature plays a flute and asks Victor, Did you know I knew how to play this? From which part of me did this knowledge reside? From this mind? From these hands? From this heart? Victor has stitched together and reanimated the creature by appropriating the knowledge of ancient alchemists, contemporary science, the research of his mentor, his father's riches, limbs and organs stolen from morgues and graves, embryonic fluid gathered from pregnant mothers, the mysterious forces of lightning and electricity. Considering the social and intellectual input of individuals, the communal knowledge and natural resources that Victor has appropriated, does he really have any proprietary rights over his creation? The creature, Shakespeare might say, is made up of shreds and patches, freely appropriated by Victor. And Shakespeare would know what he was talking about. He himself appropriated heavily from Hollinshead, Ovid, Plutarch, Thomas Kidd, Italian poets, and his peers. Shakespeare wasn't the only artist appropriating and extending the work of others. Shakespeare's works were themselves freely appropriated, adapted, translated, published, and performed in derivative forms. This was the norm in Elizabethan times, the era that gave birth to the English language and some of its most universally acclaimed works. Elizabethan England was late in getting swept up in the cultural renaissance of Europe, which began in the 14th century in Italy. The Italian Renaissance itself was made possible by the scholarship of the Arabs, who had translated, preserved, and expanded upon the work of the Greeks. Free appropriation of Arabic works, creation of derivative works, rigorous scholarship, expansion, and evolution of ideas in the arts, science, politics, and everything imaginable revived European culture from the Dark Ages. All of this was made possible without the benefit of intellectual property laws. In light of this historical example, does the argument that ideas will only be generated when creators can benefit from their intellectual property hold ground? Contemporary intellectual property law is a legal device that confers on the copyright owner exclusive rights to an original work, thereby making the work their intellectual property and protecting them from theft or unauthorized use of the work. But does intellectual property law truly protect creators in practice? Consider the birth of rock and roll. You know that stuff that Kiss tells us, Gov gave to us, and put it in the soul of everyone? Except in this case, God took a bit of a circuitous route. First, he brought European imperialists to the New World. Then he inspired the imperialists to extend property rights over other human beings, so the European colonists brought slaves who were their property to work the lands that were their property. After centuries of suffering endured by African-American slaves, they started to formalize their songs and the blues were born. These evolved into rhythm and blues and then rock and roll. Black artists worked with Jewish and some race-blind Caucasian producers to record their songs, press records and distribute them. The records gained popularity across racial lines throughout North America. However, the dominant distribution technology of the time was radio, and descendants of the same European colonists who enslaved ancestors of the blues artists owned the network of radios. 
Not only did they refuse to play black music, they hired white singers to make cover versions of the songs and played these songs on the radio instead. The black singers lacked the legal muscle to even collect royalties on their songs. Instead, the white singers were credited with being the pioneers of rock and roll. But they would have had nothing if it wasn't for the white stranglehold on the technology of radio and the legal mechanism of intellectual property laws. Compare this technological stranglehold with the one Victor has on his creature. The creature wants a companion. Victor knows how to create one, but if he refuses to give the creature peace in order to maintain his imperialistic influence over him. Victor instead taunts the creature by getting married himself. Victor's hold over the creature is founded on technological knowledge and a purported moral superiority. Victor certainly considers himself a superior race and uses it as a rationale for withholding equality from the creature. Technology and the classification of knowledge as property enables him to maintain control. In recent years, the protection of knowledge as property has been challenged by the technology of computing and the internet. The copying and distribution of work has now become easier and more cost-effective for both permitted and unpermitted usage. The number of individuals with access and ability to reproduce works has increased exponentially. Intellectual property law has failed to evolve and it has lost its effectiveness the current state of intellectual property law is the equivalent of enforcing pre-automobile era laws to govern automobile traffic. There is another dimension of intellectual property rights that is a recent development. In Frankenstein, Victor does not simply want to put a stop to the wanton acts of destruction caused by his rampaging creature, he wants to take the creature's life, and thinks he is perfectly entitled to do so because the biological creature is his property. Figuratively, we often call intellectual assets ideas made flesh. But the creature is, quite literally, Victor's ideas made flesh. But now that he is flesh, is he still Victor's property? Ownership of flesh, blood, and soul was the basis of slavery. But there is another area where property rights over flesh, or the stuff that flesh is made of, are being asserted. Bioprospecting is the process of discovery and commercialization of new products based on biological resources. Bioprospecting may involve biopiracy, the exploitative appropriation of indigenous forms of knowledge by commercial actors such as biotechnology firms, patenting the DNA of indigenous people without receiving their informed consent. One such case is the Diversity Project, seeking to collect DNA from indigenous people despite their protests that they do not want to submit to a project that has commercial applications. The Diversity Project is the latest initiative to chant the slogan, but we are scientists, not politicians. However, they are unable to convince indigenous populations that science and law are not simply arms of the same imperialistic machine. New imperial science relies on intellectual property law to justify their appropriation of indigenous intellectual and genetic resources and to counter charges of biopiracy and theft. So, let's recap what we have learned about intellectual property law. For one, 
it has failed to protect the theft of entire genres of work. Pre-intellectual property culture has flourished. And now, with the advent of new technology, intellectual property law is practically unenforceable. So, is intellectual property law in its current form still relevant? Can the free appropriation of knowledge lead to greater communal benefits like it did in the Renaissance? I would like to leave you with those questions and also a brief thought experiment. Imagine you are hiking in the Pacific Northwest. You hear a strange sound that scares you and you run away. But in your haste, you drop your phone. You were right to be scared. There is something in the woods. This something finds your phone, picks it up, and takes a selfie. The next day you find that you have suddenly become very popular on all social media. You find pictures of Bigfoot posted all over under your profile. You are a new viral sensation. You have found conclusive evidence of the existence of Bigfoot. You can monetize your discovery. But do you own these pictures? What does intellectual property law say? What do you think?